Let's, uh, let's read some scripture. John 11, 25 through 26. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So do you believe this? Crown with glory. 
vultures watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our God has robbed the
Good morning. Thank you. My privilege this morning to introduce our speaker to you. I first met Cheryl Auker as a high schooler at Lady Defender basketball camp. Right away she stood out. She worked hard. She worked really hard. She had a lot of ability. And she had a great spirit. Then she was here as a student. Eventually, we got her. But before that, she decided she wanted to do some missions work. So she spent two years doing some mission work uh, after high school. Then she came to CSU. After she graduated from CSU and played women's basketball, by the way, and a big shout out to all our women's basketball player alum who are watching. After she graduated from CSU in 07, she went to Penn State where she got a bachelor's degree in agricultural science. After a little bit uh, on the field, missions field, and she came uh, actually online and did through Texas A&M, she received a master's of agriculture in agricultural development. Cheryl is the director of SUSTAIN, which is a division of Overland Missions. She's going to tell you a little bit about that this morning, but there are just a few things I want you to pick up from her. First of all, I want you to see her heart for people. People who are learning to walk 
solely, wholly trusting in their God. Secondly, I want you to see that she loves being a part of the adventure that God has for her. And then I want you to see what a life lived with open hands to allow God to do his work in the ordinary, a willing heart to go wherever and do whatever in real life, an expectancy to see what God will do and to ask him to do God's size work. So please welcome Cheryl Auker. Good morning. It is such a privilege to be here. I'm so excited to be back. I'm so excited for the opportunity to share about the ministry. It has been, it really has been just such an adventure. I love being with Overland Missions. We joke, but I really think it's a reality that this is the, the dream job, that there is nothing better than serving the Lord wholeheartedly and just going out and seeing transformation happen in the nations. And the Lord is, he is pursuing people. He is pursuing people around the world. And it's this beautiful thing to see transformation come to a life, transformation come to a community as you share the, the gospel with people. Um, Overland Missions, I'll just give you a little bit of kind of an insight into the ministry and then kind of talk through some of the specifics of what does it look like doing agriculture in missions and kind of share some testimonies and all that with you this morning. But Overland Missions is an interdenominational ministry out of Cocoa, Florida, with our main headquarters um, internationally in Livingston, Zambia, at Rapid 14, right down really, truly the 14th Rapid from Victoria Falls. And so that's where I've been based for the last eight years. Overland has a, a multifaceted ministry, and so there is a part of Overland that does short-term trips that those go into communities, and that's what this, um, the picture of the, the truck and the campsite is from. Really, you just pack up everything that you need for a week with tents, food, all that stuff, and go out into a community and camp. Basically, even my, my whole life is kind of camping in communities. It doesn't get old. It's still really fun. And we just go out and do rural ministry. So it's walking from house to house. It's holding revival meetings in the evenings and just kind of flowing in that, seeing what opportunities God brings for ministry to, to speak the word, to pray for people. Those short-term expeditions are tied into long-term discipleship. So going into areas and really our heart is to spark a viral move of God in the nations. And so we know as missionaries that we're not going to get to every community, we're not going to get to every village, but that as the Holy Spirit moves, that there's going to be leaders that rise up and that they're going to become missional themselves and that they're going to have such a heart for the gospel that if we can be the spark, then that can just continue with a ripple effect. We even have a chaplaincy program with training chaplains for chiefs. We work a lot with local leadership where the chief has originally been kind of called this, um, this seat of, of witchcraft, of traditional religion in Zambia. We have seen that they are so open to the gospel. And as we train chaplains to be spiritual advisors, who they get to pick out, so they, they choose someone that they trust, and we get to, to invest in them, tell them about the new creation, tell them what a life in Christ really looks like, then they're going back to their chief, and their chief is so open, even bringing ceremonies that have been once um, just surrounded by witchcraft, bringing them to the chaplain and saying, how can my ceremony, how can this annual event that I do glorify God in everything? So there's a lot of different facets to the ministry. The one that I um, kind of manage with a team that I'll, I'll show you next is our agricultural department. You know, I have always loved agriculture. I've grown up with livestock for fun, you know, goats and, and cows and all of that fun stuff on a hobby farm. Um, and I never thought that God could use something that I so love in ministry. It was, I kind of had this weird mentality growing up that like if God ever asked me to do something, it would be something that I hated. But the reality is, the reality is the Lord has planted these, these passions, these loves that we have in our life. He's planted them in us 
to use them as a connection point with people. And that's all ministry is. We'll talk a little bit later about 2 Corinthians 5, where it starts by saying, and I love that we sang it in the song this morning, that the old is gone, the new has come, like our identity is now completely different in Christ. And then we have this ministry now. We've been called, just as we've been reconciled, we've been called to this ministry of reconciliation. And so we are ministers. Whether we want to take that title or not, that's who we are as believers. We are called to be ministers. And it's just using connection points that we have. I love agriculture, and so I can use that as a ministry. But I do want to say, I think this is a facet of missions that we have neglected. It, it's an area of, that the Christian faith actually touches that we as missionaries haven't talked about in the past. I want to read you a quote by, um, by David Platt, and I feel like it just kind of captures our heart as well. And he says, And we don't see how the spiritual world infiltrates our politics and our business and our neighborhoods and our homes and everything we do. And we've actually exported this distinction all around the world in the way we've done missions. It's been said that Christian missionaries have been one of the most secularizing forces in the entire world. We've gone into the third world context, and you know what we've told them? We've told them it's not spirits who make the crops grow, it's scientific agriculture. So we got fertilizers and fungicides and pesticides and hybrid seed, and we show them that their religion has nothing to do with agriculture. It belongs in the realm of science. What we should have said is, this is a God-created and God-sustained world, and he has designed ways for this world to operate, and we experience the most, the best of his gifts in this world when we operate according to the way he has designed it. And so we seek him, and we work in the context of how he, as a perfect designer of this world, has made us. I've seen this to be true in Zambia. I've seen a, an area that would call itself a Christian nation. I've seen this, this same Christian faith being supplemented with so much witch, witchcraft, so much traditional religion. There's so much fear involved in this traditional religion. And a lot of that has been because Christianity came but then it didn't have any impact on everyday life. And so there's two main areas that witchcraft comes through and they're agriculture and health. Because if we don't think that the Bible has anything to say about these things, then people have to go somewhere. And so people are getting charms and putting them in their fields to ensure a good harvest. They're buying charms and, and making sure that they can protect themselves against the, the neighbor who wants to send a witch to their field to steal their harvest and all of these things. There's just a Christian faith that's so determined by fear instead of by the love of Christ. And so our role as we go into communities is to bring a message that says God even has something to say about this. Um, our heart was to stay in this department is to equip believers to experience the abundant life of Christ. And this is um, our, our current team within our agricultural department, a mix of Americans, Zambians, a South African, all working together for this mission. It has been such a, a joy and an honor to serve alongside this team. We're, right now, we're based in Livingston, Zambia. Actually, our, our team has moved a little bit north of there. But then I'm actually moving to Congo. So I've been in Zambia for eight years, and now I get to be a part of a country launch team into DRC, who, praise the Lord, has had their first peaceful transition of power ever just a couple weeks ago. And so the Lord has stabilized Congo. We're so excited because all we can see is hope for Congo. It's not going to be known by what has been known in the past, whether it's corruption or war or anything. The Lord is bringing something new. He's going to call Congo by a new name. And so I get to move to Congo, but I'm going to share with you some of the things that have happened within the last years in Zambia. It's the same things that I expect for Congo uh, when I launch later this year. We want to see believers walking in the abundance that Christ has offered. He freely offered it. And, you know, believers in Zambia have been told, like, well, there's something in the future. Maybe one day you'll know God. You'll be able to see him. But for now, there's not really much hope. Imagine being a believer in this setting and be wondering, where am I going to find food for my family? How am I going to pay for my children's school fees? I'm singing on, on Sundays. I'm singing about this God who provides, and yet I don't see it in my everyday life. And we get to go into communities and say, God hasn't forgotten about you. He, he loves you. He has good things for you. And it says so in the word. This team is willing to go anywhere and do anything. They're willing to risk everything for the sake of the gospel. This is two of our team members, Savior and Humphrey. They're in this boat in like hippo waters. Um, 
And a few weeks ago, they would be so mad if they end up watching this. They're going to be so mad that I tell this story. But several months ago, they were going to a revival meeting in the evening. They were walking with the elders of the community. And they got to this river. It's dark out. They get to this river, and the elders are like, okay, now is where we have to carry you. And the guys are like, no, 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 like we, you don't have to treat us differently. We're just like you. We can get wet. It's okay. And the elders of the community are like, well, actually there's crocodiles in this river. And so we, we can tell when they're coming. And so the guy's like, okay, carry us. It's fine. <laughs> but they, they go across this. It was fine. No, no crocodiles that night, but they get to the other side and there they find a man they're immediately led to this house of a man who's basically lost like all the fluids in his body basically on his deathbed and they pray for him and he gets up and he's well they go back a few weeks later um actually uh, just a few weeks ago and did a follow-up in the community and they arrive and they see this guy like running for them he was playing soccer and it's the same guy like he's he's just great he's doing wonderful and he comes and he brings his wife, and he's like, pray for my wife, too. And so the guys, they, they minister to his wife, who is under um, demonic oppression. They minister to her, and she's set free. She has the Holy Spirit. She receives Christ. And it's, it's so beautiful to think, okay, here are two Zambian ministers, Savior and Humphrey. They minister to this couple who experiences freedom in Christ. They see that God is for them. They see that he's not left them. He is, he's remembered them. And when the Savior and Humphrey come, who are from the same background, the same situation, from the village, they minister in communities with such power and authority in the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly, it's like this couple, they're like, well... If you can do it, then I can do it too. And it starts this ripple effect that you can't stop because once people experience God's provision, once they see him as the reality of their life, then, then there's no stopping them going out and becoming missional themselves. And it's such a beautiful thing. We see this in the life of Bornfist. Bornfist, he started on a bicycle teaching on, in communities wore out his bicycle. We sewed into him a motorbike. This was his first motorbike. He got it used, and he was fixing it all the time, but he managed to go over 5,000 miles in just his chiefdom community doing ministry. And now we, we worked with Bornfist, and um, he's just, he's basically the, the best trainer. And Bornfist now, he's discipled Kelvin, who's also training. It just starts this movement that as people see the reality of God in their lives, they're so fired up. So let me tell you a little bit about what we actually teach. It's a program called Farming God's Way. And um, Farming God's Way, it's a biblically-based conservation agriculture program. And so it starts with looking at principles from the Word or looking at really taking the forest. We start, and I'll just, this is kind of one of our classrooms. Isn't it so beautiful? I love it so much. It's my favorite one. We start with just looking at Genesis chapter 2. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden. So who's the first farmer? It's God himself. In verse 15, it says that then he took Adam and he placed him in the garden to work it and to keep it. And it's this crazy picture that we have God place people in this garden, that even in the perfect world, they had this role. They were participating it with creation it, to make it even more fruitful. It's, it's this beautiful picture that we have. We see um, later on, you know, in the fall, we see the relationships that people were built into break one by one as they choose to turn away from the Lord and disobey. And the one that is discussed with Adam is the land. He says, cursed is the ground because of you. And now it's going to bring thorns and thistles. There's all of this. That there's been this brokenness with the land. But the awesome thing is, is that when Jesus came, he didn't just restore one relationship. He restored everything. That we can rely on him to walk in full reconciliation. And even in Isaiah 55, there's this crazy promise of the Lord's promise to, to replace. Okay, we see thorns and thistles. I should just read it for you. So we see there's this promise of, okay, now the land's going to produce this. But in Isaiah 55, in the midst of this beautiful promise of, um, about the word, in verse 12 it says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the 
thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So we have these beautiful things about the land in Scripture. It says, you know, this was the result of the fall. But I'm still present, and my, I'm going to replace this. I'm going to replace these signs of destruction with signs that, that, are, not, that are immovable. They're, they're not going anywhere. The cedar and the myrtle. This beautiful picture of like a, a, one is a hardwood tree. It's multi-purpose. One is this beautiful fragrant tree that's good for healing. And it's incredible to see what God promises with the land. Um, with this, we actually look at what was God's farm. God's farm is like the, the natural untouched land. It's like the forest. And so we can take principles that he has established in creation with principles of decomposition, principles of soil coverage. All of these things we can say, here's my traditional farm where there's tilling and bare soil, really terrible production. And here's God's farm that always stays fruitful, that has, it's feeding itself. It's full of life with soil microorganisms. I can't get started with soil microorganisms because they're so fascinating. And it's so beautiful, the things that God has placed in the soil that we can't even see that are sustaining life. But <laughs> we're able to take this into communities, this, this beautiful picture that, okay, if we follow, if God was the first farmer, if this thing originated with God, then we should probably be following him in it every day. How can we take what he has established and put it into our, our farms, our fields? And we see that he just has contrasts like this. Okay, so this was actually an extension officer, an agriculture extension officer. Though the one that looks terrible was farming man's way. And the one that looks beautiful was just even a couple components of farming God's way. They were right next to each other, like one bed apart from one another in this garden. When we follow God in all things, he establishes the work of our hands. And it is, it's incredible to see the difference. Um, there's a passage of scripture that I, I have in every training that, that I do with farming God's way. I ask people to read it. And it never fails that people have a, a verbal response even as they're reading it. And I want to read it for you this morning. I'll just kind of jump around in Ezekiel 36. Because it starts with saying, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Continues, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be, care be careful to obey my rules. And so we see this promise fulfilled as, as we became the house of God's spirit. This incredible thing that God placed the spirit in us to cause us to walk in his ways, to empower us for his service. And then it continues. There's, there's not even an interruption. It continues talking about the land. And he says, I will summon the grain, and I will make it abundant to you, and I will lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant. In verse 33, this is my favorite part. Verse 33, it says, Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Now when, when these passages were originally written for God's people, like this was, his, this was his heart. He was revealing his heart for his people that he wants to take care of his people, that he loves his people so much. And so he's revealing his heart here. To its original recipients, this wasn't just a spiritual connotation. You know, us, if we aren't involved in agriculture, we can take this and we can say like, oh, that's really nice. Like, we can take what it means spiritually. But when God said, I will lay no famine upon you, he meant you will not be hungry. When, when God was originally saying these things of replanting the desolate places, he was speaking of the actual land. And we can see it. When I read this or when I have a Zambian audience full of subsistence farmers, you know, 75% of Zambian's um, population are farming. When they read this and they see like, whoa, like God talked about the land, there's this verbal response of like, I, I had no idea that God would, like he meant for me good, even in my farming. 
And when you ask anyone in Zambia to think of a desolate place, they can because it's their own field. <laughs> they, they think of this place that they farmed for five years and then they have to leave it because it's finished and there's no promise in it anymore. But in this, it's like God is the one. He's the one that replants the desolate places. He's the one that wants his people to be just a billboard of his goodness. That he's, he's going to rebuild all of the, the waste places. And we see it happening. We see him answering the, the cries of his people when they come back into line with his values, when they throw off witchcraft and say, I will trust you in everything. Then we see this incredible picture of harvest. We see him answer prayers for Regina for rainfall on the same day after drought. We see poverty, an economic poverty situation transform into this where the whole field was like this back maze, but now it's laid down as a mulch after harvesting cobs that are like almost the size of your arm. We see these beautiful pictures of God's intervention in the lives of people, and we see that he's always provided for them. I think that's been something just so beautiful that I've gotten to see in the nations is that we have this mentality as maybe as missionaries that we're like packing up Jesus in a backpack and we're like, I've arrived at your community, here he is. But the reality is he's been there the whole time. He never forgot about people. He has provided for people from day one. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says that his divine, um, by his divine power, he has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And I've challenged myself recently in being like, okay, I have the opportunity to either take God at his word, to expect too much from God, or to believe too little. And I've decided I'd rather expect too much. <laughs> I've decided that I'd rather see what God has said and not allow myself to judge situations according to the flesh, to regard people or situations according to the flesh, but instead say, Lord, I want your perspective. I want to see according to the Spirit. And then all of a sudden we see that people are surrounded by resources, that they were never forgotten, that you can use mulch to help conserve water, that it's, it's a food for, once again, soil microorganisms, that... <laughs> There's so much beauty in what God has given, even building compost piles out of things that are free. A people that have been told their whole lives that they lack, that they have to buy fungicide, that they have to buy chemicals and inorganic fertilizers. They can be told now that, no, God has already put in your hands. It's like the story of Moses. When God came to Moses and he tries to recruit Moses, Moses responded how a lot of us would respond, where it's like, I think you want someone else. Are you sure? But then they continue this conversation, and God is like, what do you have in your hand? And Moses is, I, I have a staff. He was a shepherd. He had a staff. It, there was nothing special about that staff. It was just ordinary. And yet that staff turned into a serpent. That staff parted the Red Sea. That staff brought water from the rock. God takes the ordinary and brings extraordinary things from it. And so we tell that to our communities, what do you have in your hand? What has God already given you? And you, the first response, sometimes it's like in 2 Kings 4 where um, Elisha is with a widow and he asks her the same question, what's, what's in your house? And at first she's like, nothing, I have nothing. They're going to take even that from me. And then she changes her mind and says, no, I have a little bit of oil. And it was that oil that filled all the jars of her neighbors and family and friends. And so we say this to communities, and we see that God has even given termite mounds for people without livestock. There, you know, the pictures of the, like, huge termite mounds, even that is a soil amendment that they can use. And so they're seeing tangibly, this is what God has given. I see his provision. It's not just something that I say anymore. It's something that I hold in my hands. And it's, it's so beautiful. Once people see that, then they understand this is what it means to be God's child. This is what it means to have my identity in Christ, to have him influence absolutely everything I do. And the only response that's left after that is to become missional. Transformation can happen in a moment. As we have Joe, Joe and Prunella are this like powerhouse couple. They, they just received Christ six months ago, coming out of a really destructive lifestyle now they've become missionaries in their community. We see a woman like Lena, who used to brew alcohol at her home, and it created a really terrible environment for her family, her, her children, just trying to pay school fees, just trying to do anything that she could to earn money to send her kids to school. She started growing tomatoes with Farming God's Way and has seen the Lord provide firsthand. And this isn't, she's just dancing in her field because there's so much joy. There's so much peace that comes out of a life that's just surrendered. I'm going to do whatever you want me to, Lord. Um, and just a closing story. 
uh, we were in um, a village called Chile several years ago, maybe three or four years ago at this point. It was the hardest conference that I, I had ever had. Um, Gertrude and I, it was just at that point, um, it was just the, the two of us working. We had a couple of volunteers with us, but Gertrude, uh, she is Zambian from the local community that our base is nearby, and we've been working together since day one, the, the launch of Sustain. And um, we've been ministering together from that point. And so we started this conference in Chile. It was three hours late. Now, African time is very different than our time. I still am late everywhere I go, but three hours is really pushing it. And so we're just sitting waiting for people. Four people showed up eventually, and we're like, well, I guess we should start now. And the four people looked so uninterested. I started teaching, and it was like there was this wall, and nothing was getting through. So Gertrude, she picked up, and she started talking about witchcraft. And all of a sudden, it's like the Lord broke that atmosphere, and there was this interactive Bible study, and it was just a totally different atmosphere. And out of that conference came Catherine. This is Catherine and her neighbor, Joseph. Catherine started practicing farming God's way in her garden, and she was just, it just changed everything. The Lord had really done a great work in, in her life um, during this process anyway. As she had been so sick, she had been semi-paralyzed, and the Lord brought her back and restored her health. And so she's just on fire for the Lord as she sees his provision in every area of life. She's a, she was a volunteer orphan caregiver, which meant that the um, orphans of the community stayed with extended family, but it was her job to make sure that they were well taken care of. So she would bounce around to different uh, families, make sure that they were fed in school and all of that. Well, Catherine one day had the government officials come and visit her. She was one of 94 caregivers, and she drug them to her garden. She's like, you have to walk with me the one mile to my garden and see what God is doing. And she was so overflowing because she, she couldn't keep it quiet. So she's so overflowing with what God is doing in her life that she um, just says everything to these extension officers. And they tell her, they're like, well, you have to, you have to come. You have to come and tell all the other 94 caregivers. And she's like, no, I, I mean, I couldn't possibly do that. I'm uneducated. I, like, I've never been to school. I can't speak English. In her words, she said, I'm just a woman from the village. Like, who am I? Well, Gertrude and I arrived um, a couple days after that, and she was obviously really burdened by this. And so we started talking to her. And finally, Gertrude speaks up, and she's like, you know, I didn't finish school. Um, Gertrude has a ninth grade education. And the way that she carries herself, the authority that she walks in in Christ, the way that she ministers to people, Catherine is just like, no, that can't be. There's no way. And we finally convinced Catherine, like, no, it is Christ in her. That's the only reason that, that we're able to minister in this way. When we recognize our authority in Christ, when we recognize who, who we are, then we take step by step in faith, and God just expands our, our responsibilities. He just builds the confidence, all of that, just being obedient to where we are. And so Catherine, she did. She went back. She taught the 94 caregivers. I actually had a conversation with her um, this past year, and suddenly I'm like, we're speaking in English. Like, what, what has happened? And I asked Catherine, I'm like, how did you learn English? I'm like, oh, the Lord taught me. Like, maybe, maybe he'll teach me French. <laughs> um, <laughs> Catherine taught Matilda, her neighbor, and her neighbor was a victim of, of property grabbing. She's a widow, and so her husband's family has the opportunity to, like, take all of her farm equipment and everything. And so Catherine teaches Matilda, who brought all these armfuls of the things that she produced out. And, you know, it's, it's awesome to see an increase in agricultural production, but the real, the real incredible part of it is to see people who actually understand who God is now, who understand that he is not a God who is distant. He is not a God... Who, who has favorites as, as if he's, he's blessed the, the fortunate and the unfortunate ones and we're just divided like this, that he is a God who is, who is always provided. He is a God who is always present and he is a God who is pursuing people and he so loves his people. And it's just such a beautiful thing to be a part of and to know that, you know, anywhere we are, 
as we look even at 2 Corinthians 5, and, and it calls us to be ministers, you can go a couple of chapters ahead and look at 3 where it says, it's not, we're not sufficient in ourselves, that we've been called to be ministers of a new covenant, not of ourselves, but of Christ, of the power that he's placed in us. I just want to encourage you, no matter if you end up overseas somewhere, no matter if you end up right here, whatever, whatever you're looking into or what you're doing even today, that you're a minister in that. That any connection point that you have with people, that you just step today, look at today, be present where you are, and do step by step in faith ministering to people. Live with an awareness. All it is is living with an awareness that Christ wants to use you. That's it. Whether it's, it's a prayer, an encouraging word, that he wants to use you. And expect more. Expect him to show up. Because I have to tell you, eight years of being on the field, he has never not been present. He has never um, been unfaithful to his word. That he is always there. He's always faithful. He always gives the word. He always is there to, to minister. His spirit always goes out. And so I want to encourage you with that. No matter where you are, you can trust in his faithfulness. You can trust that he's going to meet you. And you can move with more confidence that he's going to work through you as you just step out in obedience day by day. Let me close us in prayer. Father, you are good and you are so kind. You are so gracious to us. I thank you that, that you have chosen us to be your vessels, that you have placed your spirit in us. Father, I thank you that, that you are pursuing nations, Lord, that, that you have entrusted to us this message ourselves, Lord. I pray that we would walk as confident ministers of the new creation, that we would walk as those that have been reconciled, that have an overflow and just have to be a part of this process, have to be participants in this in reconciling others. Father, help us to be aware of the ministry that you've placed right at our fingertips today and help us to just to increase in faith. Lord, let us be a people that expect too much. <laughs> Rather be those that, that believe too little. In Jesus' name, amen.